want you to realize there's over 300 wrecks on Grand Cayman. The reason we're trying to stay in what we call our zone B, this particular area, is that this has the most significance that a commanding can appreciate because of the wreck of the 10 sales. And unless they'll start protecting this area with our proposed park with the Department of Parks and Recreation of Indiana, we're working on setting this up plus a land-based park on shore, until they establish that, there's no use going to Georgetown on a wreck site, going to the Korean place for a wreck site, hitting the Palisades wreck site, because we'll just be doing work for years with letting people know what's there, and they'll just start salvaging off these particular sites. So this is why we're concentrating in this area. It's very important. Some more information. We assumed Gun Bay originally, and with the work with INA, the first assumption was Gun Bay, Gun Bluff were so named because of cannons that were there, some type of embankment. You'll see some records that indicate in 1808, there were cannons used in this area, the Napoleonic Wars, to protect the channel from ships coming in. The problem is these cannons can't shoot that far. So that's the first problem with that theory that the Canadians have in the, just the, the verbal record. The cannons cannot shoot a mile offshore. So that doesn't really uh, hold true. When you start looking in the archives, you'll find when a vessel went down, one of the prime items of salvage were their cannons. And these are the meanest, baddest things around at that time. If you had cannons, you had a little bit of force over your neighbors and for protection. So with that in mind, it was very, very common to take the cannons and either take them and bury them to come back later or to temporarily stack them so that you could salvage them or your uh, English or Spanish or French or Dutch. They all did this. They all took their cannons as a salvage item. But after excavating very quickly one evening, going back the next morning when the water settled, we had one cannon, and underneath that cannon, we have a second cannon. These cannons are apparently in opposite directions and they're parallel with the beach, which means they were not an embankment. If they were an embankment on their holder, they would have eventually collapsed and fallen straight down. So it would have been a perpendicular arrangement. I theorize they were probably wrapped to the shore. The shoreline has changed. Put some boards down and slide them down the planks on the shore in opposite directions where they stack a little better, and that's the way they sit today. And then after we found this information out, we started asking the Comanians involved with the salvage in the 40s, and they said, oh yeah, you're right, those cannons were in that orientation. So they have never, that we know of, and these, an attorney in the East End, somebody that was on the head of the cruise, the one we got the information from, said, yes, you're right, they were in this perpendicular, or this parallel fashion. Now, the question is, we don't know, what's the nationality of these cannons? Are they the upper gun cannons from the convert, or are they the upper gun cannons from Hodson's wreck, or are they something else? Uh, Hodson came in with a 21st regiment and wrecked on East End in 1766. We have two different records. It must have been, we don't know the exact date, but it's 1766, 1767. We see it listed both ways. Hodson wrecked, his troops came in the shore. The other vessels were afraid to come through the channels, too small. He was with a, a 21st regiment, English. 220 soldiers, they ended up force marching the length of the island to Hogstill Bay, which is where now Georgetown exists. The story gets a little more interesting, even this, uh, this week, I was speaking with Brent Bush, and Brent Bush is the assistant port authority, which I spoke with over the last few years about the wreck sites, and he has gone back and traced his family history. It turns out that his family is an O'Donnell, and was forced into service with the English he gave me the date this week that somewhere between 1750 to 1770, he was with an English vessel that wrecked around the East End area and were marching back to Georgetown, Hogstill Bay, and his relative ran off in the bush and hit. And they called him the Bushman. And the name Bush held, his relatives descended down to the bush today, Brent Bush, and he talks about the stories from his grandfather talking to his relatives of how he got away by running through the prickly pears. And if you can appreciate the prickly pears out here, they, he remembers well because of trying to pull all the prickly pears where he ran into them and the, the troops tried to catch him and he talks about bayonets, trying to stick them in the prickly pears, but he managed to get away because they just had to heck with it and left them. So Bush ended up living in Georgetown and the descendants today is one of them is a port authority. And I relayed this story of the Hodson's wreck which coincides fairly close, not to say it's exact, but it fits that particular uh, story that we're hearing. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is make this part of the park system. And we 
working on setting up a mile by mile square park with 24 different wrecks we're looking at within this park boundary, one of which is most significant for the Caymans is the convert and their cannon site. We want to leave this and to uncover all these cannons when they protect it and make them all exposed so that <laughs> tourists like ourselves can go out and see them where they originally sat and appreciate the history by seeing something that's accessible to divers and non-divers. A non-diver can go there and look at these cannons, just stand on them. Um, but we need to keep pushing. If we don't push, nobody's going to care and it won't happen. It's important for us to do that.